I'm Billy Nauman, as she mentioned, and I uh, work for the Financial Times. And I uh, work with our um, head of our editorial board, uh, Jillian Tett, on a new product called Moral Money. And um, I think what we've seen in the last couple months since we launched this product is kind of a, a, a pivot. We're, we're at a pivotal, mo a pivotal point in the discussions around capitalism. The, the FT, you know, kind of the, the bastion of, of capitalist Western liberalism, you know, when you walk into our New York office now, as you come in the door, there is a 10 foot tall sign. It's a vinyl wrap on our conference room that says, capitalism, time for a reset. And we're not the Guardian. I mean, this is uh, <laughs> like, so you hear it with the business roundtable, with the, the statement on stakeholder primacy. Um, and these conversations just all throughout this morning, these topics keep coming up and keep coming up. And it's really been something that's shifting. And I think we're at a point now where people are really rethinking kind of how business is done and what it means to do business well. Um, and for this panel, we're going to talk about ESG investing, which is a very, very broad topic. There are many different ways we could go on this. But ESG investing is kind of a, a big part of this moment. It's a big part of what we're seeing in terms of shifting views on the way the world of business works. And um, our, our panelists here all come from different different sides of the uh, of the industry, and, and they'll have differing viewpoints uh, that'll, I think we'll have a really good discussion here. But um, you know, I, I wanted to kind of start with, when you look at the ESG space, it's really kind of hard to see what's actually going on on the ground. There's so many numbers out there. You know, the big number you always see of, of money invested in ESG around the world is 31 trillion, which I think that's ambitious. Um, you see others that have questioned that. Um, there was a JP Morgan research piece that says it's probably closer to three trillion. Either way, that's that's a lot of money, and it's a lot more money than used to be in ESG. And I think you know what we're seeing with conversations with institutional investors and retail investors is this topic's not going away. Um, so I'd like to ask the panelists and, and whoever would like to start on this, um, you know, kind of what has changed? What makes ESG? something that is this important and how does it fit into in you know your your role as an investor or as an asset manager um and yeah how much of it is how much of it is real and how much of it is marketing go ahead i think esg as a term has been around for more than 25 30 years uh, i remember my old world bank days when um when the term was used and mainly in emerging markets it referred to g for governance and of course, it, that morphed to activism uh, investing across, uh, across the globe. And then, um, and then as emerging markets were growing very fast, it became evident that having um, not just looking at the global climate for all of us, but looking at energy consumption locally was a really, really important thing. So the, the E became very important. And obviously, if you're starting with very, very poor societies, the S is incredibly important. Important. So I think a lot of these terms were created for different situations, but now are getting used globally because poverty is still there. And we have people like Steve Case who look at venture and how can you bring venture and entrepreneurial spirit to the whole country, not just to Silicon Valley or New York. You have, um, you have um, also climate change, and we have lots to talk about that today, yes. of course, given everything else being at this pivotal time. So the size of the market has obviously expanded. And I think there's nobody really who disagrees that there are great, great investment opportunities in ESG, whether you are a believer in climate change or not. So do you think that there's still kind of a stigma around the, the term ESG? I mean, one of the things we experienced, you know, trying to get the Moral Money Project off the ground, it took a few years to get buy-in at a high level that this wasn't just hippie, do-gooder <laughs> nonsense, basically. Um, and I, I feel like there probably is still a perception around ESG that it hurts returns or it's just window dressing or it's just, you know, something to give yourself a halo effect. Um, Martin, did you have some thoughts on that? I do. I think that's, you're absolutely right. Uh, ESG, sustainability, mission, impact, these are like dog whistles. Um, <laughs> you, you, what we're really talking about is uh, just smarter ways to invest. You know, I think um, to reflect on your first question, if you trace the arc of investing um, in this general area, you, what, what you see is just a broadening out of things that drive risk and return. And I think where we are today is, as a society, 
we are seeing a whole new set of criteria emerge that are driving risk and return uh, in new ways, some of which are creating a huge amount of opportunity, some of which are creating huge amounts of risk. And I think as a society, when you think of ESG, to me, I just think of these are core drivers of how we um, and how, how companies uh, and investors in companies think about the world and what, what's really driving value and what's really creating risk. If I might add to that, I think, do. I think one of the things that um, if you talk to the average person on the street, in fact, a representative survey of 5,500 British people was done by the UK government on this topic to ask them, what would they like their money to be put to work on? And when asked, most people say they would love to have ESG incorporated into their investment strategy. But the number one concern is, will this hit the performance of the strategy, right? That's the legitimate concern that people have. And the good news is that we've actually looked at the data. Over the last 20 years, if you look at active large cap US equity strategies, which is the biggest pool available, it said that they incorporated ESG in some form. We didn't evaluate how well or badly they did. We just took that on face. Those performed uh, a net of fees uh, better than the S&P 500 and better than the passive S&P uh, uh, ESG index, the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. So over a 20 year period, ESG integrated strategies have added value. And that's for some of the reasons Martin's talking about, right? These are social preferences of consumers. These are things that about where do you want to go to work? What are the places of employment you want to be at? What are the regulatory trends that companies are either in, in line with or against? And that's what will create value in the past and, and into the future. So our view is that this is an ability for individuals to align their portfolio with what they want and also to be able to have uh, an attractive return profile. Can I jump in on that? I'm, I'm sorry to barge in, but over the last five years, Just Capital, you all heard from my boss this morning, Paul Jones. I'm sure he talked about this. We've surveyed almost 100,000 Americans all around the country, focus groups, qualitative polling, quantitative polling to find out what do, you, what do you care about when it comes to corporate behavior? And there are five major themes, how a company treats its workers, how a company treats its customers, how a company is investing in the communities where it operates and throughout its supply chains, uh, its, its uh, impact on the environment, and lastly, how does a company serve its shareholders? Is it well governed? Now, these things are not a zero-sum game. You don't, you don't you know, invest in workers at the expense of meeting the needs of your customers. This is about creating a bigger pie. And I think um, that voice of the public is just a really, really important voice when you're trying to restore faith in markets and capitalism. And that's why I bring it up. You mentioned the right. survey. I just think this, isn't, this is not something that's happening in an ivory tower. This is happening around the kitchen tables of America. I think you, you bring up an excellent point. And I think that one of the problems with ESG investing at large is that ESG means something different to everyone. You know, does that mean fossil fuel divestment? Does that mean investing in fossil fuel companies that are also putting money into renewables? Does that mean investing in nuclear power? And, and without you know, set definitions of this is what this means, it is really open to interpretation. I mean, we've done a couple stories looking at ESG branded ETFs and looking what's actually in those. And they may meet the criteria of an ESG fund according to what was in the prospectus, but you talk to people on the street and it may not. Um, Meg, I'd like to, to uh, get your perspective on, on the private markets. And we've seen a lot of you know, big private equity companies coming into the impact space or ESG space. Um, I'd like to get some perspective from you on, on what that looks like. What, what sort of factors are you looking at and how are you deploying capital in private markets um, and, and how is ESG evaluation uh, helping you do that or, or, yeah. or not? Well, so I was raised by progressive environmental radicals and now I work in private equity. So <laughs> it's an existential question for me. Um, you know, our, we're in the business of buying good companies and making them great companies. And great companies generate sustainable economic value. And I think we hear the, we hear the word sustainable, particularly in places like the US, and you think people wearing Birkenstocks dancing around a campfire, when sustainable literally means the ability to persist over time. And so I think one big challenge in this space is that we've conflated these ideas of morals-based investing with what makes sustainable business models. If you have a very clear preference you want to see in your portfolio, you don't want to own fossil fuels, you want to orient towards solving poverty, great. There are really interesting ways you can do that that don't sacrifice return. I think the question that's interesting for most investors and most fiduciaries is this idea of where and when does ESG data help us make better investing decisions? 
And I think the, the marketing issue has been a real damaging one for this space. Um, there was a great piece of research that came out um, that looked at companies that had more ESG policies and disclosures. So these binary indicators of yes, no, we have a policy, yes, no, we disclose it. Companies that had more of those policies financially underperformed peers by about 380 basis points on an annualized basis. The only alpha signals you could find were where you found ESG data that you could measure, so actual quantitative performance data. And the strongest alpha correlate was diversity, as measured by number of women in your workforce. Companies that had more women financially outperformed peers with about 330 basis points on an annualized basis. That's why 50% of our money is run by women. Um, in, in terms of finding the data, I know that can be very challenging. Uh, yeah. you know, me measuring the, the, the gender diversity of, of the workforce is one thing, but um, when it comes to other sorts of, you know, environmental measures and stuff like that, a, a lot of time, I mean, there, you know, there are efforts out there like SASB and GRI and CDP and all, all of these different things, but there is no necessarily industry standard to make apples to apples comparisons. Um, uh, Jonathan and I have talked about this before, but I, I'd like to get your perspective on kind of finding those alpha signals and how do you find that meaningful data that's not just, you know, people have checked a checklist and said, mm -hmm. yes, we've got a policy. Well, I think, I think Megan's right. I mean, having uh, a lot of policies out there is not enough. In fact, if you look at this, the, the, the proportion of CEOs who on earnings calls talk about ESG, the highest uh, sectors in terms of the proportion that talk about it is utilities, uh, oil and gas, and uh, materials, right? But primarily metals and mining as well. So it's sectors that you might not think of as being historically as very sustainable, but they're under pressure, and so CEOs are talking about it. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily getting it right. So you have to dig a bit deeper. And I think there's a couple of ways that uh, we think it can be done effectively. The first is, uh, frankly, just engaging, right? Uh, having dialogue with companies, being able to assess things on a qualitative basis. Take pharmaceuticals. There's no data set you can buy out there that will tell you who has a progressive drug pricing policy that's going to keep them out of Congress congressional hearings next year. But if you go talk to different CEOs and the heads uh, of, of the pharma companies, you can get a sense of how they're approaching that issue and, and then come to a qualitative judgment. So that's one way in which we think uh, that you can assess these things. The second way, and this is obviously where buzzwords get thrown around, is big data and advanced analytics. You've got to be a little bit careful, right? Just pulling glass door ratings off uh, a website isn't going to solve uh, the entirety of this. Um, there's lots of flaws with it. But there are ways in which you can uh, look at uh, uh, how a company is performing in the perception of workers and, uh, and society, as well as uh, other signals that are out there. So for example, on climate risk, you know, one of the things that we increasingly do is to look at the physical risk associated uh, with the locations of stores, um, uh, but not just where are they going to get hit by a hurricane or by increased days of heat, but actually what happens to their revenue, right? Turns out that if you're Home Depot, after a hurricane, you have a bounce that's bigger than Black Friday um, because there's obviously a amount of repairing and everything else that's going on. Whereas for Starbucks, you don't see uh, anything like the same recovery in revenue uh, during periods of extreme uh, hurricanes. So as we think about the increased levels uh, of extreme weather through uh, global warming, right, who is going to benefit and who's going to lose, these are the types of things that advanced analytics can help us to assess. So I just, just I'd say Just Capital, um, Paul founded Just Capital in order to address that self-same issue, right? So the whole idea is if you can gather reliable data, and we do that for the Russell 1000 companies across uh, 30 different issues with hundreds of different metrics and thousands of data points, uh, and put it out into the world, um, the market can use that data. So that's exactly our, as a nonprofit, Just Capital is a 501c3, uh, there to try and provide the market with that data to address that exact question you asked, Billy, which is how do we know? How do we know which companies are paying a living wage and which aren't? Which companies are doing well on, you know, gender pay equity and which are not? You know, we have that, and as a nonprofit, we want to put it out into the world so that you all can use it. I was talking with Martin before we started, and I think it's exactly that point. It is data. And we're talking about data science, but it's interesting that investment management and investors who are sort of a cutting edge when it comes to telling other companies how to run themselves have not necessarily invested in that. But I think when we talk about ESG, what is very interesting is the next generation of investing. If it's qualitative, people will be doing the sorts of things we were just talking about. They will be the ones who go and talk to the company management, not just about the next quarterly returns, but the sorts of things you just heard about. In terms of sort of data, we also did a uh, recent study with the IFC looked across 
uh, several thousand private equity firms and venture firms. This was in emerging markets, so it only looked at diversity uh, with the gender lens. And we took 700 of the largest private equity and venture firms in emerging markets, found the following things. One, more women GPs in emerging markets than the US. Two, gender balance teams had 20% more returns. So this was not a very touchy-feely thing. It was just that a lot of growth in emerging markets and the rest of the world is consumer goods. So if you have 50% of the population um, included or excluded, it does impact your returns. And of course, what's also happening is that you're seeing the, um, those kinds of gender balanced teams also investing in more women entrepreneurs. And we're seeing the same thing in the US for the first time in the last um, seven, eight years, we have a series of uh, venture firms that have been started by women. And if you look um, at, and, and growth firms, if you look at Mary uh, Meeker's latest investment, you know, it's the first uh, company that's uh, got a three billion valuation and uh, started by a woman. So, um, so we do need to keep the data. And I think if we, for example, did the same study we did with IFC for emerging markets in the US, and found out private equity firm X had so many, you know, this kind of population, and next year, it doesn't, it's not a shaming thing. It's next year it got better, and the following year it got better. That would be a good thing. Same thing for companies. So I'm of the belief, having done this kind of uh, measurement for the last 30 years, I was doing shadow pricing 30 years ago, literally. Um, there's a lot you can do. You can also throw your arms and say, it's impossible to measure this. And there's a good in-between where you can't be exact, but you can see if you know carbon emission by what I'm doing uh, with the yeah. way I drive or not uh, makes a difference. I think those are straightforward. So I, I'd like to uh, stay with you for a second and get some of your perspective as an investment committee member at, at Foundations. Um, we were talking earlier about your experience at, at Ford and trying to deploy capital into impact, mission-driven ESG. Uh, strategies and um, what was your experience in terms of the availability of investment products that that met the needs of of that investor or other investors that you've been involved with? Uh, great question, Billy. I think what I'm finding, and I think a lot of investment committee members and chief investment officers, uh, and we have some great ones here from Doris Duke and from the Institute <laughs> for Advanced Study in the population here, among others, um, what are finding is that when you are thinking about it, it actually is not easy. There is a data uh, imbalance mm -hmm. in finding good investable um, situations. And that is because a lot of people who are doing really great ESG investing don't see themselves as that. We mm -hmm. recently invested, for example, and this was very apropos what you were talking about, Ford, in a company at, in my day job at Rock Creek, which happens to have an African-American uh, CEO and happens to be providing the last mile in, in terms of telecom connectivity which happens to be for the rural poor. He never thought of himself as an ESG um, investor, but he was as much of an ESG investor as uh, anyone could. And I think when at Ford or other places, people think about financial inclusion or housing affordability or social justice, there is a lot that you can do, but when you then go and say, okay, I want to invest in those kinds of specific areas, where are the firms or funds that I can invest in, there is a data imbalance. It's not easy to find those. And I think finding that data will be very, very important for the future. Meg, what's what's your experience been on this? Yeah. I know there's a lot of dry powder in, in private equity in general, but yeah. on this space, how's it working? I, I think one challenge is we, we hear the kind of feedback a lot about there not being a lot of capacity in the space. And I think that comes down to a kind of marketing and labeling exercise. If you were just looking at the universe of managers who are like waving the ESG and impact flag, that's a vanishingly small portion of the universe. And it's not always perfectly correlated with the best investors. Um, I think it's almost the opposite of nimbyism, where sometimes we see investors who say, you know, I want to invest in affordable housing, and I want it to be on the south side of Detroit, and I want there to be a gender balance in the investment team. Like, your number of investable opportunities pretty quickly gets to zero. And saying part of the challenge is stepping back and saying, what does the market offer? And so where are we seeing investors, you know, ESG investing is not magic. It doesn't help you outperform the laws of investing. It's not poison. By thinking about these issues, that doesn't mean that you are giving up return inherently. And so I think in, in my day job, I'm not in the market and I'm not in the job of saying this is a morally good company or that's a morally bad company. I'm in the job of saying, given this company, where are their material risks or return opportunities because of their business model? And so can I give one quick portfolio company example? So we, we invested in a company in 2015 called Axel Tech. 
Um, it was a 100-year-old conventional manufacturing business. He created kind of heavy-duty powertrains for commercial and defense vehicles. Look at that, and you're like, classic impact investment. But at one of the board meetings, the CEO brought up just in passing that one of the customers had asked if they could prototype an electric powertrain for electric trucks. The meeting went on, but that was something that actually one of the investment team members latched onto. And they said, we're seeing this thing happen in the vehicle market. We're seeing the electrification of the vehicle market take off. That might be worth looking into. That moment wasn't obvious because that was a hard decision that cost about $20 million to invest in designing, prototyping, and manufacturing an electric powertrain. That ended up being the core driver of growth for that company. We sold that company to 6X because of the core growth market of we are seeing the energy transition happen. And so I think that's a great example of saying that wasn't someone starry-eyed saying we should care about the environment. It was looking at the market that that company operated in and saying, where do we put our chips down on where growth is heading? And so I think ESG is not this idea of good companies or bad companies. It's saying, let's use all of our available data and signals to try to figure out kind of how we create economic value, again, that's sustainable. I think that brings up an, an excellent point and something I've, I've spoken about with heads of ESG at, at various asset management companies and, and you know, the, theoretically, they hope that their job doesn't have to exist at some point where if you're looking at examples like that or, you know, the, the research that um, Martin's team does and these are real tangible financial, material financial factors, then it should just be part of good investing is, is the theory. Uh, Jonathan, do you, uh, how are you doing that? I'm, I'm not burger. about to yeah. get myself fired by uh, <laughs> saying that I, I want to get yeah, out. I mean, that is, yeah. But, uh, be a long time. Uh, but the, I think the point is that the issues change, right? So, uh, you know, plastic straws, right? Five years ago, this was not a topic that was front and center. Now it is a topic that I'm sure everybody who has a, a firm here that um, has gone through what they're doing with their plastic in their, in their office, right? These things change, uh, social expectations change, the work that that uh, Just Capital have done have kind of looked at that and that will, I'm sure will evolve over the future. So there's gonna always be a role uh, for people to kind of keep on top of that. But I do think that there is also a preference that we're seeing being expressed, right? There are some things that are not relative value decisions. They are absolute outcomes. And sometimes the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are used as a way of assessing this, saying, right? We really don't want any children to die uh, before the age of one, right? These are things that are just, you know, good things for society, right? And so healthcare companies that are helping to address that um, clearly are part of a solution to that absolute outcome. So as uh, institutions talk to their beneficiaries, talk to their clients about the things that matter to them, I think we're increasingly gonna say, well, what are the impacts that companies have? You have to be in an impact investing strategy, but every company has an impact on the world, whether positive, negative, mm -hmm. to the fullest extent or not. And so I think you know, institutions are going to start saying, well, if I look at my portfolio as a whole, am I doing as much as I can to ensure it's having a positive impact while still delivering the return profile that I expect? And I would say, they're going to say, I want to maximize return. Yes. And in order to mm -hmm. maximize return, I need to invest in things that are long-term value. So if I'm investing in a fuel that is cleaner and cheaper, most likely that has longer term value than one that's not, not because I'm a believer or not, as yeah. Megan was saying. Um, so I think we'll see much more of moving towards long term value creation, um, which has been what we all try to do. Are there any asset classes or sectors that are particularly lagging behind? We've talked about public markets and, and private equity, but uh, hedge funds or real estate or any, any of those where there's still a lot of work to be done? Fixed income. Um, I mean, I think there's been, you know, if you look at the sort of history of ESG investing, it's primarily been focused on large cap equities. Then you had different names being applied to different other areas, so earlier stage, impact investing, et cetera. But it's all converging under this this single sort of goal of, of or single theme of, of sort of an alternative way to think about companies. But I'd say, you know, we talk to asset managers, pension funds a lot. There's um, across the fixed income space, there's really, you know, precious little product. I'm not quite sure why that is. Um, is. Is that a, I mean, there's obviously been a lot of issuance of green bonds on the rise. Is that something that's changing? Or, I mean, I know there are also questions about, you know, green bonds and, and green whether bonds. or not those actually, I've, I've spoken to green bond managers that say 75% of what hits the market doesn't meet their criteria. 
Um, do, do you see any shifts going on to, to fixed income managers taking that more seriously? I would say it's more a shift around scale. You know, one of the problems the whole impact ESG space has had is a lack of scale. It needs to become the norm to, instead of thinking about just SPY, how do we think about products that are um, SPY flavored uh, with ESG or with justness or with impact? I mean, when we get to that point, when CNBC is talking about how companies are investing in their workers and customers, when we talk about the business roundtable's embrace of the, the, the stakeholder model, when that becomes the norm, when it's, when it's embarrassing for a CEO to walk into a room of his or her peers and know that they're making you know, 3,000 times the lowest paid worker in their company, you know, just the same way it's a bit embarrassing now around other sort of social norms. I think that's when you begin to see this this whole theme become the norm and not the exception. Mm -hmm. Does, does that extend to asset managers as well? You've got the CEO it making 3,000 yeah. sure. times the workers. Do asset managers have the same issue and do they need to take less money, change their fee structures? <laughs> <laughs> do I want to get out of here alive? <laughs> Should we ask David for a raise? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think I, I think you got to walk the talk. Yeah. For sure. I, I agree on your fixed income point. I think that's something that we saw that there wasn't a ton of product in the market. What I think is interesting though is we're now seeing market dynamics, particularly in Europe, where a lot of institutions have mandates to invest in things like green bonds, but there's limited issuance in the market. So there's actually a supply demand imbalance. That creates a really interesting opportunity from the perspective of a private equity investor. If we're looking to get financing for our portfolio companies. Could financing be cheaper if we're actually looking for it ring fence to do something like build renewable energy to provide our electricity, or it's ring fence for energy efficiency retrofits? And so I think the interesting thing about this whole market is you ask the question of will ESG investing just become absorbed into good investing? I think more and more of that is getting priced in over time as people just realize that these things are material. But I think it creates a really interesting dynamic to find alpha when you're taking a contrarian bet because people think the field is a little bit more woo-woo than it actually is. And so if we can find ways to get cheaper debt financing, because that's actually the way the market is moving, that's a great outcome for our companies. And you know we're trying to exit at the highest possible valuation. And so if we're getting higher valuations, if we're getting cheaper financing, because our companies have these characteristics and they're valued by the market, like, we'll take that all day until the market catches up. Just on, on that thing, I think one of the things we've seen that's interesting is a lot of private equity firms now do consider ESG as part of the diligence work and maybe they have an impact fund, but even just in the mainstream work they do. We don't see the same thing so much in the private debt markets. Yeah. Um, and something we spent a lot of time working on in the last few years, because if you think about the risk profile, right, it's the same companies in many cases, but you've also, you're just on the downside. So if it's material for a private equity investor, it should be even more material uh, on the debt side of the transaction. So that's an area outside of the green bond discussion, right, that I, doesn't make sense to me why this has not uh, been given the same focus. I think also if you look at the skill level of people who have been engaged in this area, it's often come through the equity. You know, you mm. remember with like Bob Monks and Nell Minow and you know, that whole area that started with the creation of ISS. Um, it was really towards looking at the equity market. The bond market, one of my colleagues at, uh, at Rock Creek, Ken Lay, did the first uh, green bond at the World Bank. And if you talk to him, his biggest concern as sort of the innovator to create the green bond is what you said, which is greenwashing. And the people who are on the bond side, for some reason, have not yet developed the skills, just because this is a new area, yeah. whereas equity has really started talking about governance, especially, which was one part of this, you know, 20 yeah. years ago. I, I, we haven't talked much about uh, climate change, the, the climate crisis, and, and how that plays into your investment uh, decisions. I think. Uh, to the point Meg was making about using this data um, as just part of your investment process, uh, how are you guys looking at climate risk in terms of where you're putting your money, how you're investing it, and, and using that in your long-term projections? If, if you are putting money in for the long term, how does climate change factor into that? Yeah, I, I would say it, it depends on the asset class and it depends on the industry, and this is where the concept of materiality comes into play. You know, what's me material for a tech company might be vastly different than what's material for an oil and gas company. Um, so I think across our energy platform, that's something that we're living every day. The energy transition is reality. It's not something that we see that's, you know, in happening in 20, 20 years, 30 years. 
And so I think the challenge is how do you confront the economic reality of our energy mix today while still preparing yourself to be investing in the future? And a lot of what we're seeing from investors is they're saying, you know, if I'm going to lock up capital for 10 plus years in a private market structure, and I have two things that are priced equivalent today, I diligence them to the same standards, I'd rather double down on the one that's oriented towards where the world is going. And so I think we're seeing that at the margin of how people are thinking about the next 5, 10, 20 years. Um, and it's a challenge because our current energy mix runs across the hydrocarbon to renewable spectrum. And so how do you place bets where you're helping to facilitate the energy transition, but you're still aware of the, the mix of what supports our energy today? I think one of the things that's begun to shift, right, is a move away from the, uh, looking at the present, like what's the carbon footprint, or mm -hmm. what's good or bad from a fossil fuel or renewable today, to exactly what you're describing, which is this forwards-looking view. And, and one of the things that we've spent a lot of time thinking about is how to model that, right? So people talk about scenario analysis. Like we don't know whether the Paris Climate Agreement will be implemented by all but one country or maybe all countries, right? But we can scenario out the various different paths that might take and what would be the impact on uh, on both fixed income and equity markets uh, were that to happen. So having that kind of capability to be able to actually turn this into ultimately value at risk type of quantification, combine that then with engaging with companies to encourage them to, to move their business model in an appropriate manner and looking at the physical risk that applies to companies. That's sort of, I think, where many institutions want to go rather than just saying, right, good, bad today based on perhaps a, a static view of, of the risk profile. Unfortunately, it's become a political issue. 15 years ago when I was at Swiss Re, uh, we looked at climate essentially as an unfunded liability. It was an economic issue. And reinsurance pricing adjusted on account of that. It was all about modeling and trying to calculate essentially portfolio value at risk. And I, I suspect that that model still holds true today. I was just going to add, I think it's interesting because regardless of what the government decide, companies know, as Megan was saying, that they have to um, make the long-term investments. So if we look at the, the numbers that are out there in terms of, and they're the biggest um, users mm -hmm. of, of, of carbon, so, or, or emitters of carbon, and they're the be best uh, way to reduce carbon emission. Mm -hmm. So if you're really serious about it, I think what, it, what we heard about in terms of sort of polling it's the young population, it's the 15 to 25 year olds today who are, uh, who are talking, marching, and saying that they want their climate um, to be a more positive impact on the future of their lives. So what, what do you, uh, I'll just throw this to the panel, what, what do you make of the debate over divestment versus engagement on, on fossil fuels? I, I think divestment, obviously, there's political, a lot of po political motivations there, and the argument being that trying to they understand that they're not going to move the needle, that there's not going to be enough capital pulled out of these companies to have any sort of impact. I mean, the impact investing market, if, if the, the GINs number is correct, is $502 billion, Aramco's pricing their IPO, trying to get $2 trillion or whatever it was. So there's not enough money to move the needle, but the idea is to shift the perception around the investment in fossil fuel companies. There is the argument that, well, you can engage with fossil fuel companies and get them to be better fossil fuel companies or you know, move more toward using renewables, but you know that may work for the super majors. But does that work for mid cap producers? Does that work for their? You know they don't have the money. They're cash poor. They they distribute everything back to their investors. They don't have the money to develop renewables even if they wanted to. So, at what limit is there to the efficacy of engagement? And at what point does divestment become, you know, the the right call? I'll throw that up to ever anyone. Happy to jump in. I think the uh, I think it has a role to play depending on the asset owner strategy. Uh, it all depends on how active they want to be and how um, how aggressive you know with their approach. And you see it not just in climate change; you see it with other social issues. Um, I do believe my twenty odd years in this space has taught me that engagement really can work, especially with companies that are trying to change. Uh, I, and I I think the whole world of proxy voting. Um, you know the democratization, if you will, of of the retail markets. How do how do the the teachers, the public employees, whose money is being invested, how do they think about the issues that are being played out um, in the investment committees and boardrooms of America? What what is serving their broader best interests? So I don't know that divestment itself can be answered in isolation, uh, outside of an overarching approach and how we think about 
you know, how, how capital being invested is going to achieve the outcomes that we're looking for. I think my parents are probably at a divestment protest right now, but um, in a previous life, Asana and I actually worked together on an endowment, the World Resources Institute, which is a really neat, about a $40 million endowment. Um, it's a scientific organization based in Washington, D.C., and their whole mission is count it, change it, scale it from an organizational standpoint, and they wanted to apply that to their endowment, which is some of the work that Asana led. But they took a really pragmatic approach to it. You know, they're an environmental NGO, but they wanted to understand the technical aspects of how that data would make them better investors. And as they looked across the portfolio, some sectors, like you know, potentially coal-fired power plants, doesn't matter how you change that business model. It's pretty fundamentally misaligned from a pure economic standpoint with where the world's going. And so they were really pragmatic about saying things, you know, we need Russell 1000 like exposure. Is there a way to take a risk managed way of tilting your portfolio towards companies that are more carbon efficient relative to peers intra sector? Where you're locking up capital for 10 plus years, can we find investors that are top notch investors but are orienting towards the energy transition? And they put, there's a great paper on their website where they built out kind of a 100% mission aligned portfolio, but very much from an investment standpoint. And the returns have held up against any conventional benchmark. I can see for foundations, there's a dissonance. If you're the American Cancer Society yeah. and you're invested in Philip Morris, that doesn't make any sense, does it? <laughs> um, if you're a, a nonprofit or a foundation, you're focused on your program side on alleviating poverty, why would you be investing in companies that are propagating pro poverty? So I could see that being a legit strategy to, to examine. You, you brought up proxy voting and um, engagement, and I think that the SEC is coming out with something today, I believe, on kind of chipping away at the ability for investors to have their voices heard. And, and that seems to be kind of the answer is always, well, engage, vote your proxies, you know, get these shareholder initiatives out there. And, and the power of investors to put those initiatives up there is, is yeah. being eroded. Is there, is there a worry that the pro-engagement argument is going to be undermined by some of the, the regulatory action being taken to kind of um, chip away at that power? Absolutely. I mean, that's why you see startups like Say.com, um, backed by uh, a Greenwich resident, um, amongst others, which is all about bringing the voice of the investor and the shareholder directly to the C-suite. And we're actually partnering with them next week on a quarterly just call with CNBC. But that's the, the whole idea is to sort of disintermediate in order to propagate this idea that investors and shareholders should be having a voice. But I, I think your premise of your question is absolutely right. It's not just around voting, it's around access to information across the board. I think Dust has done an incredible job at getting that information out there. So for your rankings for any public company, it's transparent on your website, and that goes into how you're ranking companies within the rest 1000. But the important part of that is that companies can move up and down. And so it's another component to kind of the proxy voting, the engagement, but this idea of progress, transparency around that, and giving consumers the data to know how companies are changing or not. It will be interesting, the sort of power shift between government and <laughs> This kind of um, this kind of uh, information, because again, going back to what Megan and uh, Martin are saying, in that data will be the power. Mm -hmm. And so, if the investors are looking and can access that information easily, and if you can make it accessible to them easily, I think it may matter less if a regulation is changed. Do we also need regulation on the data side, though? You look at what's going on in the EU; they've got their ESG taxonomy legislation that may or may not. Uh, happened, but they've, they've at least outlined the framework. Here in the US, um, that was pretty resoundingly defeated, uh, resoundingly defeated uh, a couple weeks ago. Is that going to be kind of a, a roadblock to more serious analysis and integration of, of these factors, getting you know, everyone on the same page about what data they should be looking at and how that data should be disclosed? And you know, right now, it's kind of a patchwork of, of different um, you know, CDP, SASB, all, all of those things. Um, is it is it workable without uh, regulatory oversight? I th sorry. No, go ahead, please. I was gonna say I actually think this is a great opportunity to be an active manager, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> messy data, lots of unstructured insights, lack of clarity. This is where active uh, strategies, whether you're a hedge fund, whether you're uh, working in private markets or in public markets, right? These are opportunities for you. I, I do think eventually the divergence between the U.S., Europe, and, and now actually Japan um, is going to mean that there will have to be some changes. Uh, but the reality is, as, as a global investor, right, we're going to look at companies on a global basis, and we're going to use the best data we can. And eventually, I, I expect the U.S. will catch up. And we're kind of 10 years behind, right? This mm -hmm. conversation 10 years ago 
uh, in the US would have had no audience, right? <laughs> in Europe, yeah. it would have had this kind of interest. Uh, we're just 10 years behind. The World Economic Forum, the theme for Davos 2020 is going to be measuring stakeholder capitalism. And there's a group there, the International Business Council, I think it's called, Brian Moynihan uh, chairs that. And their purpose is to try and create a, 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 a sort of universal framework. They're not going to define which data or standards, but just a framework that will allow um, business leaders, investors to think about these issues in a consistent way. Is there a risk that, that the coming EU legislation, if it happens, will be something like GDPR, where I think a lot of people in the US were caught a bit flat-footed by GDPR. Mm -hmm. Is this something that should be on their radar? I, I don't think most North American um, investors realize the implications for their business model of selling investment products in Europe right. under the European Union Sustainable Action Plan. Um, so if you don't know what that is, you might want to Google. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, I really appreciate you doing this, and thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The 2019 Greenwich Economic Forum is brought to you by Bridgewater Associates. Meaningful work, meaningful relationships. Churchill Asset Management, Nuveen, a leading provider of senior and uni trench debt to middle market companies. Ropes and Gray, bright past, brilliant future. Aurora Capital, inspiring partnerships. And Gramercy Funds Management, we are emerging markets. Special considerations to Bank of America. Life's better when we are connected. NOAA Private Wealth Management, a leading wealth and asset management service provider in China. Gotai Jinan Futures, a leading brokerage firm for commodity futures and financial futures in China. China Industrial Securities, a comprehensive financial group providing full spectrum financial services in Hong Kong. And Titan Advisors, built like a hedge fund. Special thanks to the Financial Times and Greenwich Business Institute for hosting us. And thank you to all the sponsors who helped make this event possible. We'll be right back after these messages. Don't go away.